to say I appreciate the opportunity to share tonight. Thank you for the offering. We got some things on my heart. It's kind of different. I am not a missionary. Let me put it this way. What we think of as a missionary. We're all missionaries. I'm a Bible school teacher. But God's given me the opportunity the last couple of years to take some missions trips and be involved in foreign missions. Sunday, when Justin was sharing in Sunday school class, he was talking about was Christ actually born on December 25th. It's kind of interesting. Everywhere we've had a chance to go, I mean, it was South Sudan and Kenya and a couple places in India. We've had pastor classes, and one of the questions every country they always ask is, was Christ born on December 25th? Now, we don't go in December. You know, we're, it's in February or August, something like that, and yet they're wanting to know, is Christ, was he born on December 25th? I normally tell them I don't know what day he was born. You know, there's nothing wrong when you don't know something. Just say, I don't know. There's 365 days in a year he was born on one of them. But I don't know which one it was for sure. And it made me start thinking about missions. You know what the very first Christmas present was? Jesus. God saying... A missionary. From the throne room of heaven to a little place called Bethlehem of Judea. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. I had some notes I was trying to dig for and I come across a couple of illustrations and they kind of fit this. It's not the passage of scripture that I wanted to look at. But I was thinking about them and one of these illustrations reminds me of Christmas. It's been a Christmas that have been not quite 40 years ago. How many of you are familiar when Kmart would have the blue light special? You see a show of hands, how many know what I'm talking about? There's a few I see that don't have any idea what we're talking about. It's been almost 40 years ago on a Christmas season. My mom said, you know what I'd like for Christmas? I'd like a pair of gloves. Well, that's pretty simple. So I went to Kmart, found the aisle with the ladies' gloves, and just as I walked into the aisle, I heard over the intercom, for the next five minutes only, we're having a blue light special in the ladies' glove department. <laughs> and it was something like it's at least 75% off. I didn't hardly catch it because as soon as they said those words, it was like a herd of elephants <laughs> come trampling through into that aisle. I was lucky to escape with my life. That was one of the Christmas presents my mom never got. <laughs> I was standing in the aisle and I didn't get three foot over to where they were hanging on the shelf. I was lucky to escape with my life. And I thought about this illustration I used one time in this Sunday school class. Picture if this sanctuary was filled waist high with $100 bills. And out in the foyer we put these big containers with one of each one of yours name on one of those containers. And we said, for the next five minutes only, we're having a special. All the $100 bills that you can collect and put in your container, you get to keep. What would you be doing for the next five minutes? <laughs> oh, I'm kind of tired. I think I'm going to take a cat now. Right? That's <laughs> for the next five minutes only. What would you be doing? And you gotta put them in that container. I mean, you shove them in your pocket, you don't get to keep them. Stick it in your wallet, you're gonna have to empty it out. But if you'll collect $100 bills, however many you pick up for the next five minutes only, and you put them out in that container and deposit them, you get to keep them. What would you be doing? 
I'm a, I'm a teacher. I like input. <laughs> what would you do? Get them. Get them. Get them. What's that? You'd be grabbing them? You have to put them in. And you'd probably pick it up. And look at this. This is a 2014. <laughs> I wonder if I could find one from each year. Let's see. Where, I need to find a 2013 next. Is that what you'd do? No. You would be trying to get every single one that you could put in that container. Why? And would you do it half-heartedly? I mean, I just, I mean, who wants to pick up and try to carry a whole armful? Have you ever done that with leaves? See how big an armful you can carry to burn pot? Well, would you be doing that? Or would you just, you know, just pick up two or three at a time? What would you be doing? As many as you could. Why? Why would you be trying to do as much as you could for those five minutes? Because it's money. And when it's money, it's value. 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 Yeah, it's money. We put value on it. Yeah. And it's a $100 bill. So if I was pennies, it might be a little different. But if it's $100 bills, if it was pennies, we'd still probably be collecting some. But it wouldn't be the same. What value would you put upon a soul? Now, I said five minutes, it seems like a short period of time, but what's your life? It's but a vapor that passes away. And as short as life is, and as great a value as what a soul is, why do we watch people go by day by day, and we're not that concerned whether we see them make it to heaven? I mean, what you put in the bank down here is going to be gone one of these days. But every soul that you reach for Christ, you get to enjoy that for eternity. Praise God. Praise God. And I thought about one other illustration that I had in notes, and it was on a different passage of Scripture, but it relates to this. And it comes back to money, too. Most everyone in here that I've seen, most anyhow, are fairly young yet. You're not quite ready for retirement. But think about if you had one week before you were going to retire. And what you're going to get for your retirement the rest of your life is dependent upon what you're going to make during this week. Now we have three different situations. You could come in and you could be like some people that really are not very interested in working, and you can stand around with your hands in your pocket all day and just waste time, and your employer will give you a penny a day. Or you can come in half-heartedly and work and do a little bit, and you can get 10 cents an hour. Or if you put your heart into it, we're gonna pay you a dollar a minute now, that don't sound like too much, but you're 60 minutes in an hour, 60 bucks an hour. That adds up. And we're going to have a six-day week. We're going to rest on the Sabbath. But the day starts from 6 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock at night. You can work as little or as much as you want to. Now you can come in with your hands in your pocket and stand around all day, or you can do it half-heartedly, or you can put your heart into it. But you're going to work for one week, and that is what you're going to be paid for your retirement. Now, how much would you want to work next week? You'd say, I put in my 40 hours, it's time to kick my feet up. Enjoy the recliner? Or would you be there from 6 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock at night? Yes. Now, I know a dollar a minute doesn't sound like that much, but you start talking $60 an hour, $12 a day, that's $720. Multiply that six, that's over $4,000 a week. Yes. That wouldn't be too shabby of a retirement. You know, and if you live to be 100 years old, you know, 40, 50 years of 4,000 a, a week 
retirement wouldn't be too bad. I think I'd like that a lot better than seven cents a week. I would probably be there when the clock started at six in the morning, and I put my heart into it till the clock stopped at six o'clock at night. And I wouldn't say, you know, well, you know, I've got my forty hours in. I would work from the first day of the week to the end. Well, it comes back to the same thing. The only difference is, you know, something like Social Security, one of these days you're going to die. I mean, sometimes the government has it pretty good. They're really getting it in their favor. They keep raising it years where you retire. By the time I hit it, they probably want you to be about 90 before you collect Social Security. But God doesn't operate that way. What I do for him in this life, I'll be rewarded for all eternity. You think about what this life is. Like we mentioned, it's like a vapor. It doesn't matter how long I live. Compare that to eternity. It says nothing. But what I do in this life, I will be rewarded for for all eternity. If I would see things from God's perspective and I'd understand the value of a soul, I wouldn't get my eyes so focused on the things of this life that are going to pass away. I want to give God my best every moment of my life. Amen. And we mentioned the first Christmas present. God sent His Son. But the purpose of that first gift, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, every time that God does something, and that includes giving a Christmas present, it's for a purpose. That's why He sent His Son. But God doesn't give Christmas presents. He didn't just give a Christmas present that first year, that first Christmas morning. There's an expression that talks about the gift that keeps giving. Well, Jesus was the first Christmas present, but he can't, continues to give. John 20 and 21, as he was getting ready to ascend, his time on this earth had come to an end. He said to his followers, As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. You know what? You ought to picture yourself with a big bow on it, all packaged up like a Christmas present. Because God has given you as a Christmas present to the world. And just as he sent his Son to seek and to save that which is lost, that's the purpose for us to reach out to lost souls. I mentioned thinking along the terms of missions. I had an opportunity a couple months back to share a little bit of mission service. And this is a passage of scripture, and even though it doesn't seem like Christmas time, it was on my heart. In Revelation chapter three, verse seven, Christ was speaking to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. And he said, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word. And it's not denied my name. I know this says an open door, but I'd like to use the expression a window of opportunity. And when God first had laid this on my heart and I was getting ready to share some of these things the first time, we had a renter and I visited with him as I was preparing for this message. And I don't remember the last time I seen him, but it was three or four days before I first shared for this scripture. I was going to be speaking on a Sunday night. Friday night he passed into eternity.
He was a backslidden Pentecostal. I don't know exactly how old Joe was, but I'd say he was probably somewhere in his 40s. He didn't realize he was diabetic. I hope God in his mercy allowed him an opportunity to repent at the end, but I don't know. I won't be surprised he fell asleep and opened his eyes up in hell. God gives us opportunities and sometimes we don't realize how short the time is that we have. Now, there's two different possibilities. One is you can go by the way of the grave. Last time I seen that man, and it was probably two or three days before he went into eternity, I had an opportunity to witness to him. And he seemed fine at that time. And sometimes you think, well, I'll have another opportunity. And we realize, you know, accidents can happen to anybody. But you don't have to have an accident to slip into eternity. I've seen too many times that I've talked to a young person just two or three days before they were in eternity. They talk about the old must die with the young can. I tell you what, that term young is getting older all the time. <laughs> Forty some sounds pretty young anymore. <laughs> to some of these kids, but you know what? I've talked to somebody on a Saturday. I think David was about 13, a boy that I knew years ago. 13 or 14, and he fell over with a heart attack two days later before they could carry him across the street to the hospital. He was in eternity. We don't realize how short time is, but you know, it's not just how short our lifetime is. But how short the time is left. You know, we're getting ready to celebrate Christmas. It's been about 2,000 of those since that first Christmas morning. How many more Christmases will there be? You know, and when I say that, I don't know that we'll be here to see the one that's in two days. Sure. Now we make plans. Why did we drive to Pennsylvania? Because if the Lord tarries, I plan to spend Christmas with family. Well, you know what? I plan to spend Christmas with family anyhow. Yeah. It may be at Grandma's house, yeah. or maybe with the Lord at his house. And be real honest, I prefer his house. Yeah. Nothing against Grandma's <laughs> house. It's nice. And I don't mind the carpet, but I think the streets of gold will be a little prettier. <laughs> Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talked about end time events. Disciples asked him some questions and they really didn't understand all that they were asking him. He began to tell them about what would happen in the early first century, around AD 70, when you have the destruction of the temple. But then he went on to tell about things that would happen all the way up to the second advent. He talked about some things would happen during the tribulation period, but when he gets to verse 32, he talks about the parable of the fig tree. He's talking about the nation of Israel and how that when you begin to see it shoot forth its branches. Well, that was a regathering of Israel that happened in 1948. That wasn't in my time, that was in my parents' time. And when he got down to verse 30. Four, he said, this generation, talking about the generation that would see that shooting forth of the fig tree branches, he said, it shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. I've had people ask me before, do you think we'll have another great awakening in the United States? That's an easy question to answer. No. What? You don't believe in revival? Absolutely I believe in revival. 
I can have revival. As a church, we can have revival. But will we have a nationwide revival? No. Why are you so pessimistic about that? Because what happens, what happened in the past anytime you had a nationwide revival? When a nation turns back to God. Righteousness exalts a nation. If we had a nationwide revival, we'd have another hundred years with this country being like what it is today. But this country is not going to be like it is a hundred years today. He that led it will let till first he be taken out of the way. Let's talk about the church. And then shall that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The Antichrist cannot be taken out of here until the church is raptured. That is our blessed hope. And when that happens, then that lawless one, that wicked one literally means that lawless one. And have you noticed the spirit of lawlessness that's in the world today? Absolutely. You look at the White House and you see lawlessness. And it starts at the head on down. That's the time and the age that we're in. And that was the characteristic that the Antichrist will have. He is that lawless one. And the United States is going to be brought down to the level of other countries and be part of a one world system. And that's not going to be 100 years from now. It's going to be in my parents' generation. You know, I thought about the nation of Israel. You remember what happened when they were getting ready to enter into the promised land and because of their unbelief, they didn't enter in? Did that just cut them off? Is the nation of Israel no more today? Now, as far as the parents, the older ones, they did lose their opportunity. God, you talked about those little ones. You said they were going to be a prey. He said, I'm going to bring them into that promised land. He said, you're going to get to wander around in the wilderness another 40 years, but there'll be another opportunity. There'll be another generation. And even though you miss that open door, that window of opportunity, your children will have another chance. I hope this doesn't seem carnal, but an illustration from sports comes to mind. And Paul used sports, so I guess it'd be all right if I did too. How many of you are familiar with football? Okay. Where the two sides oppose each other, you have an offensive and a defensive line. A little bit farther back, you have different ones like linebackers and defensive ends. And then all the way back, you have a guy, we call it guy that's all the way at the back on defense. What's that? I think I heard someone say it. No, no, no it's not the quarterback. Safety. On defense. Safety. The safety. He's the very last guy in the line. We know what's happened over the generations. There's been a generation that passed on. If you want to kind of associate that like your linemen, well, they pass on, then someone else comes up. And then you pass on, and someone else comes up. And then you have this next row, and then the final row. Well, you know what? We're already in the place. There's not a next row. Ones like my parents are the ones that's that generation that's going to see Christ come. I'm somewhere in between. I will never get to the point that that's my generation, the last generation. It's my parents' generation. It's the last generation. And the ones that are youth now are the ones that are like that safety. There isn't another generation that's going to come up after them before Christ returns. And it's not like, well, you know what, if we miss the opportunity to reach the loss like what we need to, you know, there's always that next generation. There always could be the next revival. 
What we're going to do for Christ, we need to do now. There's always been a need for an urgency. Because how long do I have here before my time comes to an end? But we're not in that place when my life comes to an end. We're in that place when this age comes to an end. And here again, I'm not guaranteed the next breath. And you can be a young person. And I'm looking at some of my kids. And you may not be to here tomorrow. But you won't have your entire life to live out. And what needs to be done in reaching this lost world, we need to be busy about it. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when that trumpet sounds? Now, I'm looking forward to it. But think about for the lost. Think about loved ones that you've got. And there's going to be a multitude saved. And I don't want to get long with it. There's going to be a multitude saved of every tribe, nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And some of my loved ones may get saved during the tribulation period. But it's a lot more likely that they can be reached right now when the Holy Spirit can work through me and can work through you. And if we don't take opportunity... And I'll close this with a couple more illustrations. Thinking about some of these mission trips. And, and it's not just missions. Remember we were at an assisted living. It's like a nursing home service. And we was getting ready to go to India. And one of the ladies was talking about how wonderful it is to be able to go across the ocean to India. And the Lord just impressed upon my heart to share with her. God's just, concern, just as concerned with that person across the hallway from as he is with a person across the ocean. I was thinking about some of these missions trips we've been able to take, though, and God has blessed. The first trip they took to South Sudan, and these missions trips, they've had pastor schools. The very first time they went and they shared on salvation. That seems pretty simple, but they didn't realize when they first went, those pastors did not understand what it was to be born again. In Sudan, you're either Muslim or you're Christian. And so they weren't Muslim, so they were Christian. And if you're Christian, you believe in the Bible. So they believe the Bible was God's word, but they didn't know what it was to be born again. And it's been just about 18 months ago we had a chance to go over to India. And the first time that we went there in the one location, and, and there was a pastor that was over probably at least 100 other pastors. And in that region, they didn't know that heaven was for women and children. They thought that, well, they looked at the scripture, if any man comes to me, I'll in no wise cast him out. If any man hear me knock at the door... And they looked at all these different passages and talked about if any man, if any man. And so they thought heaven was for men. And if you were a good Christian wife, God would turn you into a rib and stick you back into the side of your husband. So you didn't have to go to hell. But people out there, hungry for God, that didn't know that God had made a place for them. It may not be like it is in Sudan or India or a place like that. But you've got people all around you that God wants you to reach. Christmas is a wonderful time of the year. And I like to be with family. And I like giving presents and I like getting presents. But the greatest gift that I can give them is Christ. But we need to feel the urgency of the time that we're in. 
if we have this Christmas, it may be our last. And if it is, I want to do all that I can to reach souls for Christ. If we could, let's just come around the altars and.